Death Watch, chapter 11. Ben couldn't be sure, but when the chopper went into a sharp skid and floated gently to the ground at not a hundred feet from the jeep, he would have bet money that Denny O'Neill was flying it. Ben felt so good he was jumping up and down on the ledge, yelling his lungs out as the dust of the chopper's landing blew away, and he saw a man get out of it and run, stooped out from under the rotors. He had expected to see a game warden and had hoped that it would be the supervisor, Les Stanton, but the man was in civilian clothes. Ben calmed down. Saving his breath and waiting for the chopper blades to stop, but as he waited, he realized that although the engine had slowed and the blades were just lazily turning, it hadn't stopped. It wasn't going to stop, not if Denny O'Neill were flying it. Denny had told him once, Ben, the trouble with you is that you think engines want to run. Well, I got news for you, they don't. Anytime they can get away with not running, believe me, they'll do it. And engines are smart and they're mean. When everything's going good up in that chopper and you can see forever, that engine will run. But you get in trouble in bad weather and get down in a gorge you got to fly out of and that engine will quit. Engines don't like people and you better believe it. Out there on the desert, Denny had told him, in that chopper, I know that engine's just waiting for me to get myself in the bind so it can quit. Well, I don't let it. I start that booger up in the morning and I don't let it quit until I'm home again. Ben went to the edge of the cliff, cupped his hands around his mouth and yelled as loudly as he could. He kept on yelling and moving jumping, swaying, waving his arms. Denny O'Neill didn't get out of the chopper. The other man walked over to Maddox, who was now beside the Jeep, and Ben watched them as they talked. They probably had to yell at each other to be heard over the sound of the engine. The man looked like Les Stanton, but he had on a purple shirt outside his yellow trousers, and he wasn't wearing a hat. When Ben saw the man's shoes, he knew it wasn't Les. Les wouldn't be caught dead in the desert in a pair of low-cut white shoes. Still trying to attract their attention, Ben could feel something dying inside of him. This was where Maddox would be good. His lies would be smooth, logical, and convincing. The man shook hands with Maddox and went back to the chopper. Still yelling and knowing that it was useless, Ben watched the chopper swirl up, emerge from its cloud of dust and go away. It disappeared so fast, so fast, leaving only the fading sound of Denny's always running engine to taunt him for a moment longer. Ben walked slowly into the tunnel and stood at one of the biggest of the water-worn holes looking down. Maddox was walking briskly back toward the butte. Ben watched him until he was out of sight under the overhang. For a long time, he just stood there, defeated, listening to the hammer, hoping the chopper would come back, but knowing it would not. Then finally, he wandered out of the tunnel, out onto the ledge and along it to the end. There he leaned out as far as he could, keeping one hand firmly on the cliff face and looked down. Whatever Maddox did, he did well. He was braced now, the rope around his waist, about 15 feet above the ground, his boots firmly planted in the footholds he had chopped out. The rope secured around a tent peg driven into a crack in the rock. He was chopping a new handhold, the hammer head glinting in the sunlight. It would take Maddox the rest of the day to chop his way up to the first ledge. From there, the rest was just a stroll up the butte, no problem. Maddox wouldn't come up there at night. He was too cautious to do that. 
he would finish cutting his little holes in the rock and finish driving his spikes where he needed them. And then, when all was ready, he would wait out the night and come in the morning. Returning to the tunnel, Ben looked out through its stone mouth, which seemed to frame a picture and make it more vivid. The far mountains were masses of purple, rugged and alive looking. These were not the old, worn, tree-covered mountains he had seen in other places. <laughs> These were tough, young mountains, their peaks sharp and strong against the deep blue of the sky, their ridges full of vigor. And the desert itself was not the bleak and arid place it seemed, but a place full of life, a place where a plant might lie dormant for years, and then with the first drops of rain spring to full life, produce its flowers, cast its seeds, and die, all in 24 hours. The hammer had stopped. It was insulting, the thought of being killed here in the desert where he had always lived by this man from the city was insulting and outrageous. Ben got to his feet slowly and walked down to the narrow end of the tunnel. As he did so, he made his decision. Ben sat on the edge of the stone, his feet hanging down in the bisected funnel and leaned over. Looking down at the steep, smooth surface of the funnel, studying it down and down until the top of the funnel spout, also bisected, narrowed sharply, going straight on down the brescia. He noted every wrinkle in it, every rough patch, every stratum. He studied each change in the basalt's texture and memorized every tiny fissure in the surface of the stone. After an hour, he got up and went back to the other end of the ledge. There, not exposing himself, he stood and looked down at the desert, his eyes ranging from the jumble of rock at the base of the butte out across a sandy area and then into the harder rock-strewn stretch where the jeep was parked. During a few seconds in, perhaps 10 million years, a slab of the butte had cracked off. Shaken by an earthquake or moved by the force of some great wind or shrunk by cold, the slab had fallen off, one enormous solid slab of stone. When it had hit the desert, it had broken all to pieces. One piece, as big as a pickup truck, had apparently bounced and rolled out beyond the brescia and lay isolated on the floor of the desert. Maddock, going back and forth between the butte and the slab of stone, had skirted it, his tracks a clear path around one end. Ben looked down at these tracks and at that great chunk of stone for a long time and then carefully searched the other areas. There were no other tracks, only those leading from the jeep around the slab and onto the butte. Judging from the mark of Maddox's feet, just traces on the hard surface, but deep prints in the sand and almost invisible in the breccia, it looked to Ben as though the wind had piled up four or five feet of blown sand all around the slab. Going back again to the narrow end of the tunnel, he resumed his study, noting now the position of the slab in relation to the spout of the funnel and the camp Maddock had made around the Jeep. The position, Ben decided, was very good. The sun was setting now and Maddock, evidently finished for the day, appeared walking back to the jeep. Ben sat there studying him, studying every step he took and what effort he had to exert to take it. Maddock carried the rope coiled on his shoulder. The canvas bag was in his hand, two canteens bounced on his hip. The gun cradled in his arm. He walked where he had walked before, going around the eastern end of the slab and on toward the jeep. Ben watched some gambler's quail strolling into the tunnel for their evening drink. He did not move as they dipped and raised their heads, murmuring to each other. The slingshot lay gleaming dully in the fading light, but he did not reach for it. 
the birds wandered out again and then as though recess was over, gathered in an almost military fashion and suddenly, all together, took off in a small, soft explosion of wings. Ben picked up the slingshot and began working with it. Strips of tough leather with slots in the end held the rubber tubes to the yoke and pouch. It was easy to slide the leather back through the slots and release both ends of the tubes. The hollow in the tubes was about three-eighths of an inch in diameter, the rubber a thick wall around it. He blew through both tubes and then laid them down on the stone. Putting the four little leather thongs and the leather shot holder into the bullet pouch, he drew the drawstring tight and tied it to a so tall fiber. With another fiber, he bound the rubber tubes to the yoke and tied the yoke to the first fiber. Then as the last light died, he strung four fibers together into a stout cord and tied the slingshot and pouch to it. Putting the loop of it over his head so that his little kit of equipment hung down on his chest. In the dark now, he went to the far end of the tunnel, got the still warm carcasses of the birds and the lizard, and forcing himself not to think about it, sat beside the water and ate them all, pulling the meat of the lizard away from the tough, sandy-feeling skin with his teeth. Finished, he leaned down to the water and drank. He kept on drinking long after he had reached his fill, drinking until he ate. Then, his naked body ghostly in the dark tunnel, he went back to the funnel and sat down, his feet dangling. The Coleman lantern below on the desert seemed very bright, a hard, white, unblinking light. Occasionally, he could see Maddock as he moved around. Maddock, Ben said in a whisper, you're tired. You've done a bang-up job today. You've worked hard and lied well. You deserve a good night's rest. You need a good night's rest because you've got big things to do in the morning. Ben saw the Coleman moving around under the tent awning and into the tent, and the entire tent glowed. At last, the glow faded and suddenly died. Ben never took his eyes off the camp, which almost invisible at first with the Coleman out, slowly began to take shape again in the starlight. He saw no movement and was sure, as time passed, that Maddock was still in the tent, asleep by now, he hoped. He decided that it was time when he suddenly jumped up and went back into the tunnel. Feeling around among the bird droppings, he found the last of his sofa leaves and, as he walked back to the funnel, tore it into four wide strips. Sitting down again, he slipped the yoke over his head and strung the torn leaf to it, pushing the strips down until they hung with the slingshot and pouch. Now it was time. He turned, his legs sliding down, his back to the stone, and eased himself over the edge until he was hanging by his hands, his toes on the stone slope below. Then he let go.